We're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel. Here we are in the Think Tech series, the Think Tech Global series on Thursday afternoon, four to five. Uh, have we, we have with us uh, Kerry Gershanik. He is a professor, among other things, at the Royal Thai Military Academy uh, in Thailand. And also, he is an associate with Pacific Forum here in Honolulu. Hi, Kerry. Sawadi Krup. Good to see you again, Jay. Sawadi Krup. I remember Krup. that. Yes. And for women, it's Sawadi Kuf. Ka, yes, K-A yeah. and, and K-R-U-B, yeah. uh, the ending. But that's Aloha, uh, and then Aloha Kakahiaka, uh, you know, the, you have variations, how you would say that for morning, afternoon, and evening, but uh, just like uh, in Hawaiian. <laughs> it's a great country. It is a beautiful country with beautiful people. So I envy you being a professor at the Royal Thai Military Academy. That is Thailand's West Point. What's it like? Um, it's challenging. It's, uh, you've got the, uh, the young cadets who will go on to become the future officers of uh, the Royal Thai Army. And uh, the opportunity to engage with them, to, to hear their thoughts, uh, is every bit as important as the opportunity to teach them. The opportunity to engage with the officers and civilian professors at, the, uh, at this university, an academy is a university is every bit as important as what I bring to the table when I go over there to teach. Sure. You're in a great spot to watch what's going on, to feel the, the temperature of the country and how people are feeling, uh, to watch the diplomacy uh, you know, from inside. There's a great opportunity for you then. I've been able to get perspectives that I don't think even our U.S. Embassy personnel in Bangkok get because of the very uh, somewhat insular life that they live within the compound. and. Uh, their activities don't necessarily allow them the same insights that I get. Mm, I envy you that too. Well, let's talk about that. Can we, you know, sort of get a snapshot of how things are doing in Thailand, uh, you know, internally and externally? Um, I guess uh, internally, I would, you know, there was a coup that that changed things. What was the nature of the coup, and how did it settle down? Let's take the coup in several phases. Before the coup. You had millions of people in the streets protesting against what many perceived, millions of people perceived to be an irredeemably corrupt regime, the Ingluck Shinawatra uh, regime. Uh, Ingluck is the younger sister, some would say a puppet, of her deposed former prime minister brother, Thaksin Shinawatra. Um, again, a lot that we don't have time for in this particular show about uh, why people said she was irredeemably corrupt and inept. But the bottom line was you had millions of people. If we'd had the same per capita number of people in the United States demonstrating, say, against the uh, Obama regime in Washington, D.C., we would have had uh, the equivalent of 18 million people on the streets of Washington, D.C., because they had three to, to, to six million people out there protesting over the course of months prior to uh, Ingluck being deposed. Now, she was no, deposed. I was, I was there. You were there I, at the I, time? I, Yes, uh, yes, at the beginning of it. Yes. And, uh, I wondered uh, if, if what I saw continued. What I saw was very civilized protests. Uh, there was no violence. Did that change? Uh, there was a great deal of violence, but the violence was directed against the protesters. A uh, large number of people were killed, many, many hundreds injured, uh, wounded in the, in the actions. Um, you wouldn't know it from reading the New York Times, which is one of the major problems we have with uh, American understanding of what's going on in, in Thailand, is that the reporting has been horrifically bad and biased. But the, the vast majority of those killed and wounded uh, were, in fact, protesters, people peacefully protesting. The intent was to throw hand grenades or shoot 40-millimeter hand grenades into the crowds to kill mothers, children, uh, men, women, children, again, uh, to terrorize them. So those numbers that you saw on the streets would be reduced. People would be afraid to go out in the streets. So the terror campaign was taking quite a toll. Uh, the country was headed towards civil war. I'll come back to that because that was one of the rationales for the coup. The protests, I, I went out to see the protests almost 30 days total over the course of the three months that I was there teaching that semester. Every weekend I was out with the protesters, talking both with protesters and speaking also with those who were against the protesters, the, the red shirts were pro Ingluck, pro government pro regime, and the uh, yellow shirts, very simply, this is highly simplified, but just think of a red shirt versus yellow shirts. It was color coded which side you were on. Red shirts for the, uh, for the Ingluck regime, 
and the yellow shirts against it. Again, highly simplified, but for the purposes of our program, let's keep it that way. So I was out there almost a total of 30 days talking with those who were protesting, why they were doing it, and then uh, where I taught, uh, speaking with police officers and others who were very pro-regime and trying to get a, a better perspective of why they supported the regime. So bottom line is the prime minister, Prime Minister Ingluck, is removed under Thai law. It's not a coup. She is not removed by the coup. She is not removed by the protesters storming the gates of the palace. Um, it's none of that. She violated the law. She was a criminal. And so she was removed from office. By what authority? By the Constitutional Court, which is roughly equivalent, think roughly equivalent in terms of the three branches of government to our Supreme Court. Uh, she had previously resigned, and she put herself back in as the interim prime minister with much reduced power and authority. But after she had resigned, put herself back in as interim prime minister until the new prime minister could be named, she was removed under the rule of law, and that's important because under Thai law, it was entirely constitutional and entirely lawful, her removal. So the military was not involved in that? The, the, it was a judicial branch move to remove her. There was a lot, of, a lot of factions, a lot of power elites, power groups on both sides in Thailand. So to, to say that there was no interaction by the military with the judicial system, I couldn't say that. I don't know there was, I don't know there wasn't. But I do know that it was the third branch of government, there's actually four with the monarchy in Thailand, but the third branch of government as we know it in America was the judicial branch, and the, the judicial branch removed Prime Minister Ingluck from power. There was a uh, imposition of martial law. Remember I said earlier there were threats by the red shirts to, um, to have a civil war, to instigate a civil war. There was a call to have a large portion of Thailand secede from the Kingdom of Thailand, and they were going to call it the People's Republic of Lana. Everything that that implies, whenever you have a People's Republic, um, you, you could have been an area in the north. It would have been an area in the north, and the Lana coming from an ancient kingdom. Um, but there was not only talk, there was arming of the red shirts. There were large caches of. Um, weapons and ammunition that were discovered. Um, country was barreling towards civil war. That was one of the rationales that uh, General, now Prime Minister Prayut, gave for having the coup. Wow, and you were there? Watching it, uh, watching it as an observer. And never. Were you in danger? No, no. Even when I was out in the, in the streets, I never felt like I was in danger. I was in awe of the, the mothers, the fathers, the, uh, the men and women, the university professors, the, the, the field workers, the rice uh, planters, all those who were out there protesting because they were the heroes. They were the ones who went out there on a daily basis putting their lives on the line. You never knew who was going to lob a hand grenade by hand or with a 200 meter off set shoot one with an M79 grenade launcher into the group or who was going to shoot what sniper was going to fire into the crowd. The, the ties are so peaceful. They're so gent gentle people. How does this happen among them? There, there's a long history of coups, and there's a long history of, uh, of bloodshed uh, in, in Thailand. They're, they're a wonderful people, but it's just like America. You have thugs, and you have those who are willing to commit violence, to kill people, to achieve their political ends. Um, this is not a new situation. This divisiveness goes back to Toxin's regime when he was... Again, he was deposed by a coup, and with good reason. He was becoming very authoritarian. Mm -hmm. um, extrajudicial killings under his regime were a way of life, at least 2,000, perhaps more, uh, as a judge by the UN and other, uh, other organizations that track this sort of a thing. And again, uh, just as his sister, or just as Toxin did, his sister was trying to do, in addition to the massive corruption, and I'll give some examples of that shortly, um, there was an undermining, there was a, an attempt to deconstruct those very structures of democracy in Thailand that would have ever allowed another political party to win office. So quiet. So the system was broken. The system was broken and um, it, it was why you had millions of people protesting in the street, the educated, the middle class mainly. They were aware. I mean, it's not as if they were just out there um, you know, having a bad day. These people were following the action, right? They knew what was going on. 
How did they get to know? Was, was it by way of a free press? They, there's a very vibrant uh, free press. There's, there's factions within the news media, of course, those who support one political party, those who support the other one side of the or the other. Uh, social media is huge in Thailand. Thailand has the largest number of Facebook users in the world, of any country in the world. Uh, so social media was a wonderful way to get the word around. Unlike the People's Republic of China, where there, there is a, a, the, the great firewall of China, um, you can't use that to change the government there. There was no attempt, uh, provable attempt by the government to try to shut down social media. So people got the word that way and through other, other ways, the massive rallies, uh, speeches sure. that were televised. Um, so people were aware of what was going on. So where did it end up? Where are we now, today, 2015, in terms of that coup? Has it settled down? Is it, is it still in play? What's going on? Well, the, the, the martial law is still in effect. The, there's a military dictatorship in Thailand. There's General Prayut, a large number, uh, who's the prime minister, incidentally. Um, in addition, a large number of uh, the ministerial posts are filled by military personnel who are appointed. There's no elections yet. General Prayut has said there will be uh, elections in October. I take him at face value. I have no reason not to, but it uh, may or may not happen that soon. Uh, the situation in terms of the violence, uh, the violence is almost completely diminished. Um, Thailand is a country where there is violence in the sense that there's crime periodically, uh, just like any other country. But in terms of the political violence, the, 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 the lurching towards civil war, that's on hold now. That, and, uh, as the new constitution is drafted, as the new approach to how they'll, they'll set up um, the, the elections, all this is the reform committees are working their way through. There's a huge reduction in the amount of political violence. Is, is, there, a, is there repression, oppression from the people who are running the coup? Um, are, are the people free to go to the streets if they want, or are they being stopped from that by the military? There's, um, by American standards, uh, yes, there's, you're, you're not as free to say what you'd like to say. You're not free to criticize the government in the way that we would be free to do that in the United States. So by, by American standards, yes, the country's under martial law. Um, and uh, so some of the rights that we take for granted here are not uh, freely available to all the ties. And that's one of the reasons um, that the United States, to bring in the other, you know, key but before we go to the United States, States, I just want to ask yeah. you to compare this with uh, Myanmar. Myanmar had a military junta there for a long time. Yes, uh, it did not do well in the country. Uh, I wonder if you have a sense of um, whether you know this is a more kindly, gentler kind of coup in Thailand. Um, you know that the military people who are ruling it are you know, kinder, gentler uh, than what was going on in Myanmar? The 60 years that the thugs ran Myanmar, and they, they were thugs, um, very oppressive, murderous uh, uh, regime. You can't, you can't compare uh, Prime Minister Prayut's, General Prayut's, uh, and CPO. Uh, they, without getting into all the acronyms and all the names, because there's a thousand of them, but basically the junta that's running the country. Um, it's a very soft coup. Um, there's no executions in the streets, and there has been that in the past in Thailand. There's a sh fighting in the streets, and many, many, many people killed uh, by the military, and many people killed by those uh, fighting against the government. So right but now, not it's, now, it's not that. It's under control. It's not violent, at least uh, not in the streets anyway. Um, and it, 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 it's on a continuum to a place. In other words, it's not over. Uh, somebody's drafting a constitution. Somebody is going to, you know, deliver a government here after a while. Uh, and that's what I'm going to talk to you after the break. But, mm -hmm. but more than that, when we come back from the break, I'd like to talk to you about the diplomatic implications of this. Uh, the U.S. has been a, a long-time friend of Thailand. Uh, what does this mean to those relations? That's Kerry Gershenik, uh, Royal Thai Military Academy. He's a professor there. He's also an associate with Pacific Forum here in Honolulu. This is Think Tech Global. We're talking about the general, uh, the dragon, and the ugly American. And uh, in the next segment of this program, we're going to find out. So I think we know who the general is. We're going to find out who the dragon is. 
And we're going to find out just exactly how ugly the ugly American is. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm your host on Think Tech Asia, Bill Sharp. I look forward to, to you joining us each Monday between 4 and 5 o'clock uh, when we film right here in our studio in downtown Honolulu. The show, Think Tech Asia, focuses on contemporary events in Asia. And by Asia, we mean anything from Hawaii, south to Australia and New Zealand, well, west to Pakistan, and as far north as the Russian Far East. Clearly, this is one of the most economically dynamic centers of the world. Uh, and we bring you up to date on what's going on in a whole host of countries in this very vital region. We look forward to seeing you. Aloha. Back, we're live. We're here on Think Tech Global. We're talking about the general, the dragon, and the ugly American with Kerry Gershonik, who is a professor at the Royal Thai Military Academy, sort of the, the eye in the storm. There's a coup going on. The military is taking over, and here's an American professor in the Royal Thai West Point Type Academy uh, in Thailand. Fabulous. What a vantage. He, uh, Carrie is also an associate Pacific Forum. So um, as we left the exciting story, <laughs> we had a coup. It sort of settled in. It's uh, presumably we're going to have a, a new constitutional government not too far away, knock wood. Um, but there are implications, uh, huge implications. Uh, to U.S. Uh, policy, U.S. Uh, relations with Thailand uh, that have to be involved in all this. And uh, I guess, I guess so. we want to see some photos, but first I, I want to ask you, you know, what, am I right, what was the moment here in terms of the pivot? What was the moment in terms of U.S. policy, U.S. diplomatic relations in Thailand? It sounds to me like this was huge, was it? The May 22nd uh, 2014 coup uh, changed Thailand, of course. It, it, again, stopped it from veering towards the, the civil war, and it reduced the political violence and divisiveness in the country, a cooling off period. Uh, as a result of the coup, though, American, uh, the American administration, the Obama administration, followed the law to an extent. The law says that whenever a democratic country has a coup, American law says you have to take certain steps against that country. Um, here's the problem. Thailand and the U.S. have the oldest treaty of any that the U.S. has in Asia is, is with Thailand. We have the oldest friendship of any country, formal friendship. It goes back almost 200 years. To back to the king and I. Uh, before that, actually. Um, about to 1833. We have a security alliance. We have only five security alliances in the Asia-Pacific region. Australia, Japan, Korea, the Philippines. Um, and, and the Kingdom of Thailand. So we've had that alliance since 1954. The way the American reaction is perceived, this is where the ugly American comes in. The American reaction to the coup, the disdain that the ambassador, that the State Department, uh, the Secretary of State and others have shown Thailand, uh, the Obama administration policy to punish the, and again, this is their perception, the little brown brother, the sort of racist approach to uh, the Asian little brown brother, uh, has been absolutely devastating. The, uh, the, the relationship is shattered, not irredeemably at this point, but close. It's in, in bad shape. Um, and what has happened as a result of American action response to the, the coup has pushed Thailand into an actual... Uh, uh, a strategic alliance, a strategic friendship that many in Thailand are calling an alliance with the People's Republic of China. Oh my goodness! Well, that's not. That's where the dragon that, comes uh, in. Okay, uh, so we got the general and the dragon so far, and where the outline of the ugly American is appearing. Mm -hmm. So uh, let me ask you though, what were the steps taken or not taken by the Obama administration uh, to get us into this pickle? Before the coup, even before the coup, there was uh, instruction from, from my discussions with people at the embassy. There were uh, there was instructions that uh, not to uh, get too close to the senior Thai military leaders. Um, that's not a good thing because historically, our officers, our our political military officers, our our military officers uh, at the embassies and others have had close working relationships with the Thais. Well, this is a good thing. It is a wonderful thing. We've been friends. They've come to American schools. Uh, Americans go to Thai schools. 
They build friendships, they build rapport, they can talk to each other, pick up the phone in the middle of the night and call each Very other. Very important. Um, there was a distancing of that under the previous ambassador, the ambassador who is long gone now, many months gone, but uh, she was there for four years. Um, no ambassador, incidentally, now, and I'll come back to that because, again, perceptions in Thailand are just another sign that the Obama administration couldn't care less about There's Thailand. No ambassador there, no. There's a charge d'affaires running the office well, that's ever a since big ambassador. Statement, isn't it? it is perceived by the Thais as a massive statement. People's Republic of China has a very well respected ambassador who is there full time and is doing a lot to help build the railroads in Thailand to give aid to the Thai military, to give education, exchange of intelligence, a massive, uh, massive geometric increase uh, in that over the past year. The, Thai, uh, the Thais view the Chinese ambassador as a serious player and someone who's there. There is no American ambassador at a time when our relationship is crashing on the rocks. And they read that for what it is. They, they see it as a sign of uh, the Obama administration simply not caring about Southeast so Asia. So similar to uh, Ceylon, Sri Lanka, so similar. You know, the um, American presence is diminished. The Chinese presence is increased. The Chinese take advantage of any weakness that we have in mm -hmm. dealing with these countries. Uh, we lose um, decades or hundreds of years of relationship with these countries virtually overnight, and the Chinese fill the vacuum immediately. It's not an accident. They want this, and they move right in. It's, it's a zero-sum game, yes. It's, uh, it, it, in some, many respects, it's a zero-sum game. There's a vacuum on the American side, and, and the Chinese have had good relations with the Thais for many years, economically and in other ways. Now, it's, it's, um, they, they've recently uh, had their defense minister, Chang, come down and sign a five-year agreement um, with the Thais that, that is almost, uh, very, almost a treaty, not really a treaty, but it's a five-year agreement where there's a massive increase in training, uh, provision of, of equipment and intelligence exchanges, that sort of thing. So in terms of, you know, they're, they're bonding up with the country, Mm -hmm. They're insinuating their influence in the fabric of the country. Mm -hmm. Would you say now, Kerry, that the Chinese are ahead of us because of these events? Many of the Thais who were historically pro-American, who I, I speak with, and that's not just military. I deal with business people and, and executives in, in their 30s and uh, 40s. And uh, people who were historically pro-American studied here are now turning very anti-American. Uh, it has to do with the administration's policies. It has to do with a disastrous visit by the Assistant Secretary of State, a guy named Dan Russell, just before a major exer a military exercise called Cobra Gold last month. Uh, basically, they took the visit as insulting. They took it as arrogant. Uh, everything he did and said was taken in an extremely negative way. So that has exacerbated a situation that was not good since May 22nd. Americans had previously cut off, or the Obama administration, again, some of this is required by law, um, they'd cut off military exchanges. They'd cut out about, a three, about $3 million worth of aid. My friends in the Royal Thai Armed Forces say, okay, America, you cut off this much. It used to be very important to us, but you cut off basically the tip of the thumb when it comes to military aid. The People's Republic of China wants to give us this much. So who do you think we're going to, you know, who do you think we're going to lean towards? They're just up the road. You're thousands of miles away. You couldn't even get your full complement to a very reduced uh, exercise Cobra Gold this year. You couldn't even get the 5,000 that you said you were going to put up instead of the usual 8,000. Again, punishment to our little brown brother, the Ties. We're not going to send 8,000 like we did in the past, only 5,000. Again, seen as a slap in the face, and we kept saying it was a slap in the face. Uh, Dan Russell and others did repeatedly in public speeches. We're punishing you essentially for having the coup. Are, are the American, is the American uh, diplomatic establishment aware of how much ground they've lost in this process? I hope they are. We pay them a lot of money. You, you <laughs> minister counselor at a U.S. embassy gets uh, you know hundred, several hundred thousands of dollars a, a year because of all the benefits and the housing and, and the cost of living allowances. One hopes that our our foreign service personnel are aware of this. There is not a lot of evidence 
uh, from the Thai perspective that they are. There's a perception that the, uh, the previous ambassador, who, again, I'm simply reporting what the Thais tell me, she was viewed as the Glam ambassador. Her idea of communicating with the Thais was to tweet what she was going to have for lunch or tweet uh, her, about her new shoes. Um, the Chinese ambassador doesn't tweet about his new shoes or what he had for lunch. She communicates other things. You know, we're, we're rebuilding your dilapidated rail system, Thailand. We're going to yeah. make you a major economic player. We're investing in you. Yeah, we're investing in you, and, and we're going to work together to, to make you an economic powerhouse. Are they getting bases? The Chinese getting military no, bases? No, there's, um, it, it's just a massive increase over the, the, since the May 22nd coup of interaction and cooperation, collaboration. Do the people have, the people, I mean, everybody that you run into, mm. do people have an idea about the way the Chinese operate and, you know, what their ultimate goals are in this, in this area? Uh, or are they being maybe a little naive about what the Chinese intentions are? I don't think the, uh, I don't think General Prayut and his, his officers and the, uh, the others I talk to are naive. Uh, Thailand historically has done very well. It's maintained its freedom by cleverly uh, balancing Never occupied France, by England. a foreign power. Um, well, okay, the exception, another totalitarian, uh, aggressive, imperialistic uh, Asian power, uh, Imperial Japan, 1941, uh, actually did attack Thailand, but then Thailand became an ally of Japan. So when you say, were they occupied or were they allies, that's... <laughs> It's a fun, the, okay. the point is, it was a nearby country that had very, uh, very large military, massive military might, and imperialistic designs, and uh, and, the, and the Thais again have been very good at balancing to maintain their integrity, their sovereignty, and their territorial They're integrity. Good at that. So, are they naive? Do they understand that there's problems with dealing with the Chinese? I think they do, but they also look at the landscape. Uh, America's credibility right now in the world is not all that that high. Um, we've we've taken drastic hits in terms of our prestige, our military might uh, is nowhere near what it was even six years ago, um, and our influence uh, is not all that uh, not all that impressive anymore. Well, you're there on the ground. Do you see also uh, that they have? Uh, you know, media exposure that, that everyone does uh, to what's going on, say, in Washington, on the cliff, not a cliff with Homeland Security, uh, that some of the, you know, loss of confidence um, that has taken place in the last couple of years around government in Washington, are they aware of that? Does that affect their thinking? I think um, that they're aware of major problems with the, the way the U.S. government operates. Um, again, the, the New York Times is of great influence in, in Thailand because the, the major English language paper, the Bangkok Post, is affiliated with the Times, so they get a very, you know, for, for good or bad, and in many cases it's bad, they, they get the New York Times view of America. Um, so that covers, or that, that spills over into the Thai language press as well because of the, the, the resources that they use to, to develop their stories on America. That's a whole different show, Jay. We could talk about what it is about American culture, not just American policy. 90% of the people there, 99% of the people couldn't tell you what America's policy really is. 99% of Americans couldn't tell you what, <laughs> what America's policy really is. But what they do see is they see American television program after television program where people are getting murdered all the time. Yeah. They see the Miley Cyrus, they, they, see the, they listen to the rap music over there where it's uh, denigration of women, it's rape, it's, it's killing. And they start asking themselves, do I want to send my daughter to study in America? Is, is, this, is this the cultural influence I want if I'm a devout Muslim father from southern Thailand or I'm a devout Buddhist mother from central Thailand? Is this the influence that I want or do what I get from the tightly controlled cinema coming out of China, the tightly controlled uh, television programs from other countries. Yeah. Is this a better model for us culturally? Mm. And uh, that we, we delude ourselves and our cultural officers at the embassies delude themselves when they think, oh, you know, they, they've got Coca-Cola, they've got blue jeans, they've got, they've got rock and roll, they, they love America. Mm, they don't understand just how negative the perception of America is by our own movies, by our own television and uh, certainly by a large part of the music that comes over there. Well, you know, one other thing, um, 
before we go to a break is that yes. uh, the U.S. is um, well, it hasn't it has not been impressive in its dealing with foreign policy in other places and military policy in other places. Yes. I mean, no one could say that we've done a Herculean job in dealing with ISIS. Uh, we have uh, essentially walked out of Afghanistan with, you know, with an obvious result that it all folded up after we did. Right. And the same thing. And Iraq. With, the same, the same thing with Iraq. Right. Uh, and you know, if you're a th third person from another part of the world looking at that. You probably don't have a lot of confidence in uh, the U.S. ability to handle these difficult situations. Um, how does that, I mean, uh, how, how do the Thai people react to that, and uh, what kind of reaction do they have? The, the average Thai person isn't looking so much to America to um, come in and, and save it from the, the communist uh, insurrection that went on for so, almost 30 years over there. It's not looking at any existential threats to the country other than its own civil war, possibility of civil war. They're not looking at foreign invasion. They don't, most people can't, couldn't conceive of the People's Republic of China invading them. It's just not, it's not conceivable to them. Uh, and so they don't really follow American policy in terms of security all that much, but they do see the results of failed policy. They do see the headlines. Um, so those who pay attention, and just like in America, the vast majority of people don't, but those who pay attention aren't seeing a positive story about America. There are no, there are, there are a few successes, and then the ones that are touted um, uh, don't pertain to Asia that much. The pivot, which has been talked about ad nauseum for so many years, is, it's not readily identifiable. We've talked about the pivot longer than it took us to win World War II. <laughs> World War II was about four years, 19, December 1941 until uh, May or, or September of 1945, or May in Europe, September in Asia, uh, it ends. Um, we've talked about the pivot that long, and they don't see anything particularly mm -hmm. tangible. Well, it's probably because there isn't anything particularly e tangible. Exercise Cobra Gold, the largest multinational exercise in Asia, which Thailand and the U.S. Mm -hmm. chaired, up until this year, which there's a sea change. Everything's a sea change this year. Americans have to understand that. The, the, the de facto, the growing alliance between Thailand and China, not Thailand and the U.S., uh, Thailand and China, a sea change may not be reversible. The sea change with the multinational exercise Cobra Gold, which the U.S. and, and, and Thailand started in the early 1980s. Um, now China, as of this year, because of the way America treated Thailand, uh, Thailand uh, has now made China, which only had six people, not 4,000, like the U.S. this year, made Thailand an equal partner, or I'm sorry, made China yeah. an equal partner with that. So there's so many indications that America's stature in Thailand, in Southeast Asia, has slipped irredeemably. The whole pivot is in question over there. It, it never was taken all that seriously because we never backed it up. When we come back from this break, Gary, I'd like to talk to you about what we can do to fix it up, mm -hmm. put Humpty back together again. That's Kerry Gershenik. He's a professor at the Royal Thai Military Academy. He's also an associate with Pacific Forum here in Honolulu. This is Think Tech Global. We've been talking about the general, uh, the dragon, and uh, the ugly American. And uh, they're beginning to make sense now. We'll be right back after this short break. Hi, my name is Andrew Howard. I'm an astronomer at the Institute for Astronomy at the University of Hawaii up in Manoa. I'd like to tell you about the annual open house that we're having. This year it is on April 6th, 11 to uh, 4 p.m. It's an all-ages event, kids, grown-ups, even uh, people in between. Everyone is welcome. We have a lot of uh, really fun activities. You get to meet astronomers, look at yourself in an infrared camera, play with Legos, make robots, look at videos. Um, you can even make it. Some of the kids like to make comets out of uh, gravel and, and, uh, and snow. Even adults like to do that, too. You'll be able to look at the sun with a solar camera uh, safely. It's really a great activity. We do this every year um, in April, and I hope uh, to see you this year. Thanks. We're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel. Here we are with Kerry Gershanik, who's a professor at the Royal Thai uh, Military Academy, which is Thailand's West Point. And he's here on R&R, &R, I guess, from that <laughs> short trip. 
semester uh, break. <laughs> okay, it's a school break. Uh, and he's also an associate with Pacific Forum, a think tank here, part of CSIS in Washington. So anyway, we're on Think Tech Global. We're talking about the general, the dragon, and the ugly American. And we have a couple of pictures we need to look at just to demonstrate Kerry's last point about the relationship that the Thais are building with the Chinese or vice versa. Uh, here's some pictures. Kerry, why don't you describe what this is? This, um, these are Thai soldiers carrying the, the flags of the People's Republic of China and Thailand uh, in honor of the, uh, the visit by the Defense Minister of the People's Republic of China recently to, to Bangkok, where the, the Thais signed a five-year military agreement with, with China. Um, the next picture that you'll see coming up, uh, and then that's symbolic, really symbolic to see those two flags side by side, uh, no American flag. Uh, this is the Defense Minister of China, Chang, with uh, the Defense Minister of, of, of Thailand, the Kingdom of Thailand. Um, but again, this is highly symbolic. These are the images. You asked about what is it the Thai people see? How do they get their information? These are the relentless images that they see on the front page of their papers. These are the images they see on social media. Friendship, conciliation, no judgments. The, the, the Chinese are always, uh, they've, they've consistently reinforce the point that we'll give you this support, we'll give you this military aid, we'll, we'll make these deals with you regarding the building of your railways and these other trade deals. Uh, we don't attach any strings like, you know, implicit in that is like those, those evil Americans, like the ugly Americans. Um, right or wrong, I'm simply re telling you yeah. what I observe and what the perceptions are over there. There's, there's reasons we, we put strings on but, military but aid, get out the of Chinese this, don't. What I get out of this is that you know, we can have a relationship going back to 1830 with the Thais. Mm -hmm. Long, deep, deep, you know, diplomatic relation, a historic connection yes. between our two countries. And yet, what did you call it? A time of sea change. We are in a time of sea change. Right. And that relationship may be, may be cast out virtually overnight if we don't watch our interests. It's really important to maintain uh, diplomatic uh, uh, mutual respect and relations with a country, even if we have had a long-term relationship with it. What I get out of this is that we could lose it much quicker than it took to develop it. We have, have lost it almost overnight in terms of, again, the, the, the ties who I talked to who have been educated in the U.S. Um, turning anti-American. Um, the administration needs to take a, a, a really quick well review. that's what i'm asking so Maybe. this is we now have about uh, six seven minutes left yeah i'd like to dedicate this time to trying to figure out what steps we should be taking as a country uh to repair to uh reconnect our relationship with thailand america has to start showing respect for the government in place right there they, they treat the former government under ing uh, they treat her look sort of like an ansan Suu Kyi from from Myanmar, from Burma, she's not. She's very corrupt. Uh, she was trying to, de to destroy those instruments, those or the, uh, the, those organizations and institutions in Thailand that would have allowed the continuation of democracy when she was prime minister. It's been proven. $15 billion vote buying scheme called the Rice Scheme, 15 billion U.S. between 15 and 16 million uh, is what she is currently in legal trouble for, uh, but it was a vote buying scheme. And so the whole idea it sort of undermined this this concept that well she was elected we, you know it's a democratic uh, democratically installed government okay but if you're buying the votes with 16 billion 15 to 16 billion dollars in, in in rice subsidies how democratic was that and how you know is it the form of democracy or is it the substance that you're looking for <laughs> and I think we have more of the form but not the substance sort of like what happened in Egypt the the ties know the world situation. The Thais see great hypocrisy in the way that the Obama administration's treating the government of Thailand. The Thais say, we're your longtime friends. We fought the Vietnam War with you. We worked together to defeat the communist insurgency that was trying to overthrow the king, the monarchy, and our government, our democracy in Thailand. And yet, you slap us when we tried to avert a civil war with our, and there, there were other reasons for the coup, which it might, you know, I can get to later, but when we tried to stop the bloodshed, ties killing ties, you slap us, you insult us, you, you denigrate us consistently in public, but the same State Department, the same president, is almost on bended knee 
to the Castro brothers in Cuba, begging to establish full diplomatic relations with what is one of the most uh, dic dictatorial regimes ever in, in uh, the, the American continent. Uh, mass murderers, the Castro brothers, people who've attacked the United States, had terrorists attack the U.S., uh, many ways harmed our interests throughout the region and around the world, killed American soldiers, and you're begging them for full diplomatic relations and to establish a full embassy, and you're, you're treating us like your little brown brother in Asia. You're slapping us. So they see the hypocrisy uh, what there. About they Modi? see it in Egypt. Uh, the administration is spending a lot of time with Modi. Uh, how, how does uh, how does the uh, Thai uh, community react to that? Again, they roll their eyes, and you know they're, they're very polite. The Thais, when they talk to me, unlike other you know other countries around the world, when the Thais talk to me, it's always leaning forward, very sincere. Carrie, please understand this. Uh, but it's 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 a proverbial rolling of the eyes and saying, okay, here is a man that you had persona non grata, what isn't allowed to come into the United States, and then President Obama flies over and he's given him the the. Uh, the, the hugs and, and uh, reaching out to, to Modi, they see what it, the American policy was in Egypt after the elected government was overthrown by the army. Islamo-fascists who were elected, seen by the army, overthrown, and then the, the, the U.S. recognizes the government that comes in subsequently. So they're seeing what they perceive as great hypocrisy on the part of the you U.S. Know, you know what this sounds like? It sounds like some of the bad calls that the U.S. made in South America where they didn't really know what was happening on the ground, right. and they went with the wrong side. It sounds like if U.S. policy is going to be effective, we have to inform ourselves about what is really happening in a country. And right. it sounds like, from what you say, we did not do that, so we made the wrong call here. There is, again, strong perception. I'm reporting more than I'm giving personal opinion here, but I'm reporting... Um, what I see, heard, and I read in Thailand, the perception that the previous ambassador was um, very pro red shirt, very pro Ingluck, very biased. Um, there's a lot, of, there's a lot of substantiation that the Thais find for that. I can give you many examples, but it's very too but that, detailed that, that's for the part show. Part of American policy, though, you yep. you you uh, you sidle up to the existing administration, the existing government, the one who is controlling the country. Right. And that's where your loyalty is. Uh, right, but afterwards there was this continued, uh, again, a lot of incidents, activities that the embassy and the ambassador personally did that showed a preference for the red shirts, a preference, so, inviting only red shirts, no military, period, for the first time in anyone's collective memories. Uh, no military were invited to this year's 4th of July picnic, which is a big social event in any country, the, the American Embassy's 4th of July picnic. Ambassador, the ambassador was there at the time, chose not to invite anyone from the military. And people who, again, very pro-American, they've been there every year, and now I'm not invited. It's a statement. Uh, but, but many, many red shirts. And, of course, all these pictures and people from the previous regime were invited. Ousted regime at this point. Uh, pictures all over social media so there's no secrets here there's there's nothing hidden so these these all reinforce the many ties perceptions of bias uh by the u.s embassy and the u.s administration so sounds like got to start really showing the regime thing, more respect when you have a transfer of power such yeah. as in a coup when you have one government that is uh, you know debunked mm. uh, for corruption or otherwise and another government uh, a coup or not that takes over and clarifies things yes. and makes peace in the street. You have to change your policy to that country. You have to be really nimble about it. And it sounds like the U.S. was not nimble, and this ambassador was not nimble. We were stuck in some old view of the country when we should have been watching more carefully. Is that the lesson here? Yeah, I can't... Yes, we should have been more nimble. There are reasons. Our, our, our historical experience with the British we we don't like military rule okay and there I, I agree with that that we should support democratic rule but america's democracy doesn't apply to every country and we shouldn't be holding them to the same american standard especially when they face an existential existential threat to their country the existence of their country is in question we shouldn't especially an old friend a friend who we help nurture with democratic processes, democratic thought processes, democratic institutions. We shouldn't so harshly treat 
that friend when, when that friend's going through a difficult time. As friends, we give advice in private, as the Thais have often done with America. They, one, one, something that makes them an especially useful friend is to help America to navigate Southeast Asia better. We've relied on the Thais historically, but they always gave us advice in public. They didn't chastise us publicly. They didn't, they didn't give the advice to the news media. It was friend to friend. That's the way we should have been working with them as they worked their way through this difficult time. There's a lot of other tactical things that need to be done. Anything dealing with Thailand is bogged down. Any policy issues from the Department of Defense, Department of State Commerce, bogged down in a very cumbersome interagency process in Washington, D.C. So any, and this is a slight exaggeration, but any foreign service officer, first year foreign service officer, or any GS-1 or any second lieutenant can block something that's a good idea for improving relations. That's, again, exactly. We have to look at our own systems. We have this. to look at our own system it's for a, improving a, things and get someone who actually knows Southeast Asia. Dan Russell is not a Southeast Asia expert. The other people we have in key positions in the State Department and Department of Defense who are dealing with Asia, there's not a whole lot of hands out there who actually know Southeast Asia like there used to be, at least well, not Gary, in this administration. So we're out of time. We've we, we got to go. I'd like to, I'd like to come back to you if you're going to be around long enough and get more on this in terms of uh, what, what the U.S. could do, not only in Thailand, but in other similar countries that try to improve our positioning there against the Chinese. Kerry Gershanik, uh, professor at the Royal Thai Military Academy, uh, which is Thailand's West Point, and also an associate with Pacific Forum, which is going to have uh, Richard Armitage here uh, in early March for uh, the annual what is it, the annual dinner? The uh, annual dinner, please come. Everyone's invited. Uh, you get in touch with Pacific Forum, CSIS, here on Bishop Street, and uh, join us for a great talk by Richard Armitage and uh, great fun with our young leaders and uh, young professionals who work at Pacific Forum. Yes, I'll be there. Come. You're going to be there, I'll Jay, be there. I know, and I'll be there, too. I'll see you. I'll see you there, Kerry. We're heading back to Thailand. <laughs> this is Think Tech Global. We've been talking about the general, the dragon, and the ugly American, and we have learned a lot about recent events in Thailand. Thank you so much, Kerry. Thank you, Jay. <laughs>